Uh, my name is Rich Harrington. I am the publisher of PhotoFocus, and we are holding a HDR Hangout on a weekend. Not the normal time that we do it, but wanted to try a weekend, and uh, I'm glad some of you have commented that you're not normally able to join us live, so glad changing the day worked for you. It also worked for our guest. I'm going to quickly introduce them and uh, let them tell you a bit about themselves. Uh, first up, we have Ron Pepper, who is a panoramic photographer as well as an evangelist for Photomatics. Ron, why don't you tell folks a little bit about your background? Yeah, I am uh, over here in San Francisco where I'm a professional photographer specializing in panoramic, as Rich said, and that makes me naturally a, an HDR needer, <laughs> someone who really needs a more dynamic range in a shot since my images are almost always 360 degrees, so it's brighter on one side, darker on the other. So I've been using HDR techniques for about a dozen years now and um, working with HDR soft as kind of a a lot of things, actually. In addition to an evangelist, I handle a lot of questions that come into HDR soft, especially the photography questions. So, if you during or after this, if you have questions about how to get the best out of it, you can shoot us an email support hdrsoft.com. And a lot of times, if they're photography related, that'll be me that replies. Excellent, excellent. And we are also joined by photographer Dave Wilson. And Dave, you are currently out of Texas, is that correct? That's right, yeah. Living in the middle of nowhere between Austin and Dripping Springs. Good. Tell folks Although a from about the accent, background with photography and how you got into HDR. Sure. Well, from the accent, you can probably tell I'm not from Texas originally. I moved over to the States in 94 from Scotland. But uh, as far as HDR goes, I've been doing it for about 10 years or so, initially caught up in the wave of enthusiasm surrounding Trey Ratcliffe in Austin. Um, doing a lot of artwork to begin with, and as time's moved on, I've moved more in towards realistic HDR. I still do artistic as well, but more often than not, it's now a tool to get the job done, to get around the limitations of my camera than something to create art. Um, I also teach various classes at uh, local clubs and through our local pro camera store. Excellent. Excellent. Well, welcome. Those Thank of you joining us live, you'll find a Q&A pod on the web page for the Google Hangout, or if you're using the Hangouts app on your phone. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, we won't be able to see the Q&A part, but feel free to jump on over to the Google Plus page. I'll try to jump into there as well just to see if there's any other comments or questions. We, all, we will take questions during this event, so if there's things you want to know about HDR or workflow, we'll do our best to answer them. And today, we decided to focus on realistic HDR which I think is an interesting trend. Uh, we've sort of seen some additional HDR tools come onto the scene lately, and they've gone in opposite directions. For example, Lightroom has added the ability to merge to a 16-bit uh, HDR type file that has an interesting amount of dynamic range. It's a float file, and uh, they're keeping it as just a raw file with expanded highlights and shadows if you shoot it that way. And then there are other tools that are popping up on the market, and we're seeing some interest there. And then, of course, one tool that we've all used for a long time and that I love a lot is Photomatics. And we're going to show you this idea on some recipes for creating natural-looking images. We'll jump into a couple of tools. But sort of starting out here, uh, one of the things I think that's important is this conversation of natural-looking HDR. And uh, in a way, this is almost a bit of a backlash. We've seen people get really entrenched with HDR and that it sort of developed its own artistic look and there are some very famous practitioners of that. And people love that, but there's been a lot of backlash in the photography community. Dave or Ron, any sort of strong feelings here? I know, Ron, you use this as a tool to create interior images, and I don't think a lot of homeowners want their property to look anything like anything like what it actually looks like. They want it in the best light, literally. Right, I think uh, Dave said it really nicely where, because where he, there's a two, two kind of different directions you can go with HDR that makes it look that look like something that wouldn't naturally come out of a camera. But the more the thing that I've always used it for is to get away with, uh, excuse me, to get around a limitation of my camera. And he said it really nicely that where I want it to still look like a photograph, but I want to show the view that's outside in addition to the interior at the same time. And that's photographically impossible with just a single shot. So the uh, I think initially when HDR came into the world of photography, it was so easy to get sort of these, uh, these kind of unusual results, and they're attractive at first, but then it probably went too far, maybe. But the whole time, I've been wanting to use it as that tool, and I would say that uh, what I go for is an image where you look at it and you don't realize that it's HDR. Maybe it could have been shot 
by using lighting instead. So, for instance, the old I remember when I was um, working in restaurants, we would have a photographer come in and they would spend all day. I never did this professionally, so that's why I'm saying it this way. They would spend all day setting up lighting to light the interior of the room, and then with one shot, they would be able to balance the exterior view with the interior based on lighting. Uh, by the time I got into photography in the early 2000s, um, with no budget, I wasn't using lighting, so I didn't do that kind of photography. Then when HDR came available, wow, I was doing that kind of photography right away. And the idea was to not make it was to make it look as if the interior had been lit and that it looked like a true photograph. And I think one of the things that people struggle with or they forget is that when your eye looks at a scene and you survey a room or an interior, it's capable of adjusting and exposing for all the different things. So when you glance out the window, your pupils dilate a little bit smaller. And when you look into a dark, shadowy corner or underneath the table in that restaurant, your eyes open up a little bit more. And you're able to see everything. Maybe not all at once, but as you survey the room, your eyes could process this. But photos and cameras typically can't. We've seen improvements in raw files going from 8-bit to 10-bit, and now 12-bit, and even some 14-bit. So that helps quite a bit. But the truth be told, I think a lot of people get confused and they don't realize that a 32-bit image is incredible. That, you know, this is basically 2 to the 32nd power. So with 8-bit, you've got 256 levels of detail. When we jump to 10-bit, all of a sudden we're at 1,024. Well, I don't even want to do the math for 32-bit because it's just trillions billion. Of more colors than that per channel. And so it's just a ton of information and detail. Mm -hmm. Dave, how do you use this in your photography? Uh, I know that you shoot a variety of subjects, and I've seen you do some editorial. Do you yeah. find a workflow where you can use HDR in places where people traditionally said, oh, you know, I don't want that HDR look? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, HDR has had such a terrible rap because of the HDR look. And honestly, I keep telling my students that HDR, look, HDR is not the look. HDR is a set of tools and techniques. It just so happens that people notice the ones that are overly processed or more unrealistic. Um, but I use HDR for editorial and that kind of thing quite frequently because it does get by these limitations. And Ron said, yeah, you could perhaps get by with lighting. That's true in real estate. If I'm shooting landscape, I don't fancy spending my time lighting a landscape to get the balance right. With HDR, I can do that. Um, I'm trying to think of some examples. Recently, I had a picture in Backpacker magazine recently. It was an HDR. Um, you've got to be kind of careful. Some editors, again, shy away from anything that's considered to be dig digitally manipulated. So I'm always very careful to point out that this is a composite image created with multiple exposures and that kind of thing. And generally, they're OK with it. But the, the main thrust when I'm doing an editorial piece is to get an image that, as Ron said, looks the way I remember the scene. So I'm not looking for something hyper real, funky textures, ridiculous saturation. I'm looking for an image that mirrors what my eyes saw that morning or whenever I was there. Very cool. Very cool. Well, let's actually do an example of that. I'm going to do a quick example to get things started, and then I'll, I'll toss to each of you. Let me just uh, open this up here. I'm going to take sort of an interior example from a bit of a real estate project. So let me just open this up. I'm going to screen share really quick. There we go. And uh, let me just put this window out of the way for a second so you don't get that terrible echo. There we are. And can you all see my screen OK? It's fine here, yep. OK. So uh, what I have here is a shot from a hospital. And this was a children's hospital. And it, they wanted to showcase how comfortable the rooms were and that this was a place especially designed for kids. And so as we look at the different images, and I shot bracketed, I'm able to expose for different things happening in the room. And as we take a look all the way up to the brightest exposure, you see, well, great, there's no really dark shadows or anything here, but the windows are totally blown out. And I could, of course, have great exposure on the window. It's covered with a translucent shade here, but it's difficult to see everything. Well, those can all be sent on in, and you could pre-process these in Photoshop or Lightroom if you want giving you other options. We'll show that workflow a little later. I'm going to send it right to Photomatix for a second and merge these. And there they all are. And I want to just take a second to show you that unprocessed image. So when it merges these to 32-bit, that's fine. Now, I know that this was shot on a tripod. So I can tell it to align and just say that this was shot off of a tripod. That's great. And 
there's really no ghost here. There's a little bit on the TV screen, so I'll actually turn that on for a second, and uh, everything else looks pretty good. So I'll align that and show the deghosting. And the reason why I did deghosting was that there was a video game playing on the game cart there in the kids' room. So there was different content on the screen for all five exposures. So what you can't actually see, let's zoom in here, is that it was on a screen and there was just a little bit of issue. So there we go. Let's just move over. Hey, Ron, here's what I'm forgetting. When I zoom in, is there a way for me to control where it zooms? Or how do I pan around? I'm forgetting. I always pan around with the trackpad because I use a laptop. Ah, there we go. Yeah, or scroll wheel mouse would do it. I was I switched to machines here. So you could look at that screen there, and you could see that there's a couple of different images on it smashed together. So I can selectively deghost that and just sort of select the content of that screen. There we go. And I'll just say that's pretty good. Let's mark that as a ghosted area. I'll preview it. Cleaned it up just a little. That's fine. And that worked pretty well. Let's just go ahead and send that over. Actually, that's interesting. It decided to latch onto a different area. That's okay. You can right-click the area. And you can What's that? You can return to selection mode and right-click the area and choose a different source image. Yeah, I think I need to do that, don't I? So let's just choose something. That's the base exposure there. And preview it. And that looks a lot better. Thank you, Ron. Good tip. So in the selection mode, guys, what we could do there was we can actually say what photo should be used. So instead of it using an overexposed or underexposed image, it got it so that that screen was available. Good tip. I always like when I learn something on a show when I'm doing a demo. It's always a good thing. Always humbling. So we get this open, and we create the merge, and that's the 32-bit image. Now, you could save that off if you want, because we can actually use that and open that up in tools like Lightroom and others later, or Photoshop or anything else. And so I'll just save that as a HDR image. I prefer the EXR format, which is a little more compatible with Adobe, both Lightroom and Photoshop. And I'll save that and just capture that file. And now that we have this, we can move on to sort of what comes next. So what I want to do now is actually take this image and we're going to start to process it. So Ron, once that image is saved, and we want to kick forward, what would you do from here? I'd go Command or Control T for tone mapping, or you can go to the edit menu. Tone okay. And so the tone mapping part is how we get out of the 32-bit image, and we're basically taking it back to a 16-bit image, because that's all we can actually print or show on screens these days. I was going to say, I was going to bring up when you were saying something earlier that uh, I think Dave was saying that something is or isn't an HDR image, and we hear that a lot. Like, you can see an image and say, that's an HDR. And yeah. this, this is kind of nerdy and maybe techy, but <laughs> actually, and if you're looking at an image on the web, it's not an HDR image. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, an, it's an image that may have started as HDR, but then got processed. Right. right. And, and I realize that the, the vocabulary grows in this world and becomes what it is, but what we just saw, that 32-bit image that, that uh, Rich saved as an EXR, that's a 32-bit file, <laughs> but he's going to tone map it now, and then it's going to become an image yeah, it's been tone mapped and it came from HDR techniques and things, but once we're viewing it, technically it's not an HDR image. It's one that's been tone mapped or fused or done this. But so just some people find that interesting and some people find that annoying, but that's... <laughs> yeah, well, let, let me open that up really quick because Photoshop is capable of showing us that. And so right now, it's a 32-bit image. And you'll see that a lot of the Photoshop adjustments are grayed out because we can only make an exposure adjustment, a hue saturation, photo filter, channel mixing, and levels. Other things like curves are actually grayed out. So we have the ability to expose and adjust things like the gamma. And then with a layer mask, you could actually technically paint in and do some of this the painful way of paint in different levels of exposure. Like I can go back in and paint that window in and do things. But this is slow and tedious. So I'll toss that away for now. The other thing that people will sometimes do is they'll actually forget that when you go and you say, well, let's get out of a 32-bit image and go to 16-bit, we have the ability to actually adjust this. And we could choose how this happens. So this gives you a chance to use Photoshop's tone mapping options here. So you can play with the shadows and the highlights and what comes through. And you hit OK. 
and it does the conversion from 32-bit to 16. And that's fine. But it was a different image that is not possible to see everything on the computer screen. There's a lot more stored inside that 32-bit file. Now, one of the things I like about Photomatix, just to get it nice and simple, is that there's a whole category of presets simply called realistic. So as a quick starting point, you could just plow right through those, and you'll see different options. I like natural. Enhanced is kind of a split. It still looks realistic, but what I like here, compared to the, uh, the balanced view here, is that it's almost like the lighting highlights from the brighter images came through a bit more. So it does kind of look, I'm just going to say it, like I actually lit the room as opposed to just shot under the available fluorescent lighting. So what's happening here, Ron, with this sort of option here? It's still realistic, but it's pushed the lighting effect just slightly, right? Yeah, there. You know, the, it's always important to know that when you every set of images is going to be different. So just because someone made a preset that usually works to look realistic doesn't mean it will always work. And it's important to remember that everything you shoot is going to be different. And to me, on, at least on the screen share there, that didn't look terribly realistic to me, but <laughs> maybe it's better on yours. But, well, uh, we could tone down the strength of the lighting effect there. Yeah. And the presets are usually a, a place to start, not a place to finish. As well. right. Yeah, I'm intrigued that you're using... Uh, tone mapping actually at this point, because typically for realistic images, I'll always go for exposure fusion. Yeah, well, that's I'm just walking through the categories. Some of these do go to other options. So, for example, as we go into fusion here, it is just showing us the interior and basically giving us a super highlights and shadow slider. So I can lift up the shadows, expose the highlights, find the right overall brightness level and saturation, and now it's sort of behaving like a super raw file. There's more information there than the single image, and it allowed me to bring out particularly the shadows under the bed here. So there are different methods. There are tone mapping, and you can go with a very light tone mapping, or exposure fusion, which is essentially combining things. And I'm sure we're going to walk through these different options, but essentially we have the ability to fuse multiple images together using different methods here. And these are sort of ranked from simplest, where it just took two images. So you could say, you know what, let's go with this one for the exterior window and this one for the interior brightness, and it combines those two images together. Or automatically blend those together, and it attempts to take the properly exposed areas of each one. Or balance out the exposure by averaging. And Ron, as you're working with these, it seems like as we move up from the bottom up, we get more controls with each one. What's the logic here behind this stacking of the different fusion methods for natural? Well, you know, that's interesting. I didn't notice the order necessarily, but I would consider all but the top two of them, the, the ones that you see at the top of the list, those are kind of the, the modern ones that are really used. The others have been around a long time, and I haven't really used them <laughs> In a while. Maybe the exception would be average, which is there's an insider tip. You can take a few images uh, either at different exposures or the same exposures and average them to reduce noise. There's a really nerdy insider tip. But the uh, two at the top, Fusion Natural, is really a wonderfully simple way of, of uh, processing bracketed images that just, just brings the dynamic range together. Um, doesn't do too much fancy work where you have to know a lot of detail. Uh, then the Fusion Interior is the, one of the newest methods. That's only since uh, Photomatics 5.1. Mm -hmm. used to be called Fusion Real Estate, but the intention for that method is an interior space with a bright window. <laughs> yeah, and as a user of that, Ron, that's a fantastic uh, option. I've found it to be incredibly good, and one of the only times I'll use um, a Photomatics preset at the default. Um, typically, I found with my real estate stuff, if I stick it in Fusion with the real estate or the interior option, now it just looks good. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's kind of a nice balance. If we toggle between the before and after, you just see that like the window stayed nicely exposed, yep. and all those shadows yep. got nicely filled in. Well, there, the, you know, the, as Dave was mentioning, um, and I agree that exposure fusion is wonderful for interiors and for uh, uh, real estate architecture, things where you want to keep it very realistic and simple. The downside to fusion, exposure fusion in Photomatics is called Fusion Natural, is that it didn't 
preserve the window very well. That was always a just a limitation to you, where you would go to tone mapping if you needed to do that more. And so there was a demand for that, especially from like real estate photographers and interior photographers. And so that was one of the big uh, updates was to have that situation where when you had, again, that interior and the bright area was relatively small like a window. Like if it was a vast uh, sliding glass doors and big windows on covering most of the space, it wasn't a problem. But if the window is a small area in relation to the rest of the scene and the shot, then it wouldn't preserve it very well. So um, the engineers got together and did something smart there. I don't know what the secret sauce is there, but they was able to preserve those windows better. And that's just been a huge thing for people. People like it me. Works beautifully. Yeah. yeah. Hey, at this so, point, we've actually got a question that's come perfect. in from Mary. That's probably. I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm stop screen sharing unless oh. it's about this image. Um, it probably is actually. It's about uh, photomatics in general. It's probably worth talking about because it's a, sure. a different way that photomatics works from a lot of other tools. Mary wants to know if it's possible to add two or more presets to an image in photomatics. Um, photomatics presets are not like tools as such. They're just preset settings for the tone mapper or the exposure infuser. So you can't add more than one because clicking on a preset just sets all the controls one particular way. But, but what you could, I after, you, after you do something like this and we do actually tone map the image, we have the ability to save that and then yeah. you can actually invoke yeah, it a second time and redo it and then yeah. combine those two images. Yeah, I don't know what Ron says about that. The only time I would do that kind of thing is if I've got radically different images that I want to pull a tone map in different ways and then combine. But I, th I suspect Mary's thinking of other tools where you can add multiple, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, I guess tools on top of your image one at a time and layer the, the effects. And, layer. and it doesn't work quite that way. Yeah, I mean, what I could do is I could save that image out and then back here in Photomatics, after I've done it the first time, I have the ability to re-tone map that again. You could do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Jump back in, do it a different way. Sometimes what I yeah. actually do, this is a strange use, but I'm just going to put it out there, is I'll go for a really nice black and white image to get nice drama in my tones, something like this, let's say, mm -hmm. and then I'll save that out. And let's just yep. save that. And uh, save as... There we go. And then it opens, I have them both open up in Photoshop, copy, and blend them, and I'll just paste that. And yeah. then with the layer selected in the move tool, you could do shift plus to step through your blend modes right. and find something where the blacks are adding to the image, like there, mm -hmm. and then just tone down the opacity. And so sometimes I will do yeah. two images like that just to get a little bit more richness in the black. So you could technically composite afterwards, but you're right. It's right. not an effect that you stack. It's presets to drive the controls that you then tweak. Yep. Okay. Well, let me stop screen sharing, and uh, who's ready to go next? Let me, uh, let me segue with uh, something Mary asked about, um, because she might have, she might have meant um, applying the se several presets to, uh, <clears throat> to the same images to get all the different results. And <coughs> you can do that with batch processing with this rather full-looking window here, because there, you have the option to um, multiple presets. I'll just show quickly, and you can in this little box here, you can add um, multiple presets to the so that you, you take the same set of images and apply different sets of either preset, a different preset, or different sets of settings, and then you would end up with that many different types of results. So, mm -hmm. if she meant that way, then the answer is mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Yeah, you could. You could sometimes you can do that, and I'll I'll batch process sometimes for time lapse that way too. That works really well, Ron. It looks like you're getting an example queued up. Um, a question came in that was good though. How do you know when to use tone mapping and when to use exposure fusion? And I, I think that the the exposure fusion is going to be the more toned down look right away. So if you are concerned about overdoing it, maybe start with with exposure fusion and then build up from there. Ron, any suggestions? Uh, yeah, the answer is it depends on what kind of results you want. But if you're getting started with it, I would do a lot of trial and error. Uh, for instance, you can use that batch processor, and literally, if you wanted to, you could apply every preset if you want. But you could also, uh, the, that's what I did when I got started with it. I would take batch processing, and I would take a like either a job or just if I just had some personal shots, I would run it through batch with 
many different methods and just see what kind of results I get. And that way you you, uh, you find out the pros and cons of each one. Um, now with the current version, you can go through and just click one preset after another. And as you do that, you see, you'll see you see that uh, each preset uses different settings, but also meant they use different methods. So it'll switch quickly for you to, and I can, might as well be showing this, right? <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, I, uh, I pulled up a set of images I haven't played with for a while. I thought it would be fun. It's interior here. Um, hold on, let me pull this up. And then. So uh, just really quickly, it's an interior on a tripod. So I don't need to align. There's no ghosting. It's, there's no movement in the scene. So um, I reduced noise when I converted it from raw. So let me just show you this image. Uh, this is one of those where it would have taken a bunch of lighting to light up the interiors. <clears throat> the downtown San Francisco. This is where they want to uh, rent you office space in downtown. So they have these open offices, and they wanted to show that it has this cool feel, of course, outside. So if I let me fix this to the window first. Okay. Bigger. Trying to maximize the size here, so. Looks better on the screen. Okay, if I have these presets over here and I choose all styles, I can literally click one and it's going to change all the settings that you see on the left. So right now it shows tone mapping with contrast optimizer. We haven't even talked about that one yet. It's also good for interiors and good and for realistic images and it uses tone mapping. I click the next one and it's using tone mapping with tone compressor. I'm not sure if this shows in the screen, but that's up here in the top left. And then I move to the next one, Natural, and that's now using Exposure Fusion with Fusion Natural. And so, it's nice how the chairs are coming out and the shadows on the desks are eliminated while the windows look perfect. Right. Yep. And that's the idea with the scene like this one where it's, I mean, the space is really simple, but it does have some neat things, has some brick, and but mostly it's about the exterior view. And But to, just to go back to kind of learning about what, type of method is best for you. I think the best way is just to go ahead and click through these at this point. Yep. This one's called Painterly and it's something you'd expect to see. It gets some of them are more realistic than others. There is something that you would call the look, I suppose. Oh no. Yeah. So so going through these and just seeing on the left what which not only which settings is cho are chosen, but just which process and method is you're gonna learn really quickly about the differences, I think. Yeah, another thing to note that's really important is that the presets are not the only options you have. Yeah. I use them as inspiration. So you find one that's something close to what you want, and after that you go and tweak the controls that have been set for you. Right, exactly. So you, generally speaking, you find a preset is not the end of the job. You find a preset that's kind of nice, and then you fix the, the image from there. I agree. Uh, to, to continue with choosing which one, you, you can. there's now a filter for some, some styles. You can filter, so for instance, there's... Just reading the styles, there's artistic, realistic, architecture, black and white, but there's also options where you can just show presets that are for fusion or just for uh, just for the new contrast optimizer. So now you can just go through those presets and see what types of settings may be possible. And then, like Dave said, once you get kind of close, a tweak and adjust from there. So for me, I would go. I, well, I would go. Let's go to architecture. So there's just a handful of their kind of recommended for that, and mm -hmm. I know that the interior ones use that one where we mentioned before. It's intended to, for a space with windows. This particular space might have enough windows that the <coughs> natural works pretty well, maybe even better than the interior one. So that's interesting to see. I was an older job that I just pulled out last night getting ready for this. So. Um, yeah, that, I would. That's what I would recommend is going through those those presets, and you really learn pretty quickly about what what uh, what's possible. Well, Dave, why don't you queue up an example? Okay. And, uh, I I grabbed one more really quick. That's an old one, but worth showing. And uh, it's this one here, and I think you guys can see it. And these are really old. Like these pictures were originally shot. Oh gosh, <laughs> back in two thousand six. These are ten year old digital photos. And I knew enough back then, I had just started using Photomatics, and I was on a camera that didn't support bracketing, So, I, and I wasn't allowed to use a tripod. So I had to go through and adjust the camera settings, being very sure not to move things, and I just, you know, to be perfectly honest, I just jumped, and I worked my way through, 
and you know this is Independence Hall, and they don't let you light, and they don't let you bring a tripod in. So, decade-old photos, and they still work. And so, you know, using that realistic category, it's nice that we can just step through, and that's amazing to me. In this case, I really like the enhanced look, which is technically a tone map, but the windows hold up pretty well, and it's not bad. Or the interior option there works pretty well, but again, I might just back down the brightness just a little bit because I want it to feel just a little darker because it is an interior, but I love how what was lost is preserved. All that detail in the window and all the details in the chairs are filled back in because we were able to merge all those exposures together. So I think it's important for people to realize that this technology can make dec literally a decade-old image look pretty good if you remember to shoot with brackets. Yeah, you actually bring up another point there that's worth noting. Uh, it used to be that I would tell people you had to shoot from a tripod all the time. And over the years, Photomatic's ability to realign images that are slightly out of alignment has improved immensely. Because these were slightly out of alignment. Yeah. There was no tripod. And, and nowadays, I mean, I quite frequently, I'm not, not unless I have to, I, I quite frequently shoot handheld brackets. And... Uh, that will allow me to um, use Photomatic and generate a really good looking HDR image even though I had no tripod or was not allowed to use it on that particular date. So, We're on your screen there, Dave, if you want to show this. Okay, so beautiful. you guys have looked at some interior stuff. Um, I'm going to go outside now and look at a picture I took of, oh gosh, Delicate Arch, I believe. Is that right? Yes. Uh, in Kynelands National Park a few years ago. And this was taken shortly after sunrise, looking straight into the sun. So... Let me show you the brackets I have here. This was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven brackets. Obviously, I want to show the detail in the rock, but when the rock detail is visible in my shot, the sky is completely blown out and the background areas are, are not interesting at all. Um, so let me show you a completely different way of processing this, still using uh, HDR soft software, but not actually going through the Photomatic user interface at all. I'm a Lightroom user and I'm using Lightroom here. So let me... I shall go back to the folder in the library. You actually see the result here, but never mind. I'll select my brackets, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all of those. And I've installed the merge to 32-bit plugin. Can you see my, my menu here? Or is that invisible? It's invisible, but we believe you. <laughs> okay. Well, I've, I've just clicked, right-clicked on, on the images here, and I've picked export from Lightroom, and I've got merge to 32-bit HDR from HDR soft in my list. So I'm going to click that. And this is going to, let me just see if I can reshare this to give you the, the whole screen. Hold on a minute. Um, I, I need to show you some secondary windows that are not visible just now. No problem. Just share, uh, go back to sharing and yeah, share your sure. desktop and everything will show up. While yep. you're doing that, there was a good two good questions that came in. One said, once you've merged, you delete the originals. And I'm of the camp that uh, storage is cheap and technology only gets better. So yeah. sometimes I'll go back to images that I processed five years ago, or like I showed you here ten years ago, and the quality that comes out is so much better now than it used to. Like there's the alignment that we didn't used to have and other things that have come a long way. So uh, I'm a big believer. I just, I've just i got you know two Drobos that mirror to each other and then go up to the cloud. I've got, gosh, seven terabytes backed up in the cloud and mirrored across two devices, and it's beautiful. So keep your stuff. Absolutely right, never throw away the originals. Yeah, I'm with you there. Um, okay, I think we're up and running. Can you see my, my whole yep. desktop? Yep. Okay, so this is the merged to 32-bit HDR window in the center here. It looks a bit like the usual um, window you see when you pull in your brackets to uh, Photomatics. In this case, I was shooting on a tripod, so I'm going to leave the align images turned off. Um, I know there's no ghosting in this image at all. It's a static scene. Nothing was moving, so I'm going to leave that turned off. Reduce noise. Don't care about that. I shot my brackets nicely. I've got lots of shadow detail. I don't need to worry about reducing noise. Rename my files just the ordinary way. Add a suffix. Now, one thing, Ron, maybe you can tell me, is this new? Scale pixel values to fixed range. It used to be when I used this option, I would generate an HDR file, pull it back into Lightroom, and it would be a horrible dark mess. And I've just noticed this new checkbox here, which if I turn on, makes the image look good when I bring it back in. Is that something I did in 511, or has this been around for a while and I've just not noticed? Uh, it's been around for a little while, but you're right. Okay. It's, exactly, it's exactly in response to the way yep. that Lightroom initially shows the photo for some reason will be brighter. Yep. So anyway, leave this turned on, makes the image look better when you pull it in. So I'm going to click Merge, and next to nothing seems to happen for a bit. Uh, Lightroom's exporting those seven images 
as TIFF files across to Photomatics behind the scenes. And in a minute, all that will happen is a new image will pop up in my Lightroom folder. And this is a 32-bit image. There we are, the new one here, 32-bit image. And what you'll notice is I'm, I'm a Lightroom junkie. I do most of my work in Lightroom. If I go into the Develop module, it looks exactly the same. This is now a 32-bit image, and Lightroom can handle this and develop nowadays. So it actually looks quite good already, and I'm quite happy with that. It's so much better than we used to get. It used to be you'd pull these images in, they'd look terrible, and you'd have to tweak them to fix them up. But if you look at the exposure here, normally I'd get, I think, a four-stop range, maybe a five-stop range. But now that I'm using a 32-bit image, I can pull the exposure 10 stops either way. See that? And obviously, you can't see much after the first four or five, but you've got an enormous range in your various Lightroom sliders now. So I can use all the standard develop module um, tools in Lightroom to process this 32-bit image generated by um, HDR software, Photomatics in the background. Um, I can click auto to do something like a standard uh, image. See, I've got detail in my rock. My sky is a bit washed out. I can probably fix that up later on. Let's use a trick that I use quite frequently to make my skies better. Hue saturation lightness tool. I'll pull the blue down a bit and pull the aqua down a bit. I get a better looking sky that way. Uh, I can use all my standard adjustment brush, for example. Let's bring out, this is going too far, but I can brighten up the rock here if I wanted to. Down here, perhaps. From Leon about where did you get the 32-bit plug-in. Uh, that's... And that's yeah. from Photomatics, but I believe, Ron, you guys have recently stopped that one. You have? Well, no, it's it's still there. It's just um, it's only hidden because one. So Lightroom started making their kind of a 16-bit version of this. So it, we thought it was going to make it obsolete, but that wasn't no. really the case. People still really want it, but it's um, you'll find it there uh, on the um, <laughs> purchase page. It's just that there's a there's a paragraph there saying, hey, you might not need this. We're trying not to sell something. That you guys are yeah. way too nice. <laughs> the, well, the, I mean, I still use this a lot because the, the Lightroom option is 16-bit. So if I've got 14-bit RAW files, which I have from my camera already, 16-bit only basically gives me two stops additional dynamic range. Whereas there's, there's a 32 a slight, bit file. I, I got schooled the other day on this. There's a slight difference between the two. And I'm okay, so it's floating this. point versus... Uh, yeah, floating point versus integer. So the 16-bit floating point is still not as good as a 32-bit, but it's a lot better than a normal 16 Right, uh, your quantization gets enormous when you switch uh, yeah. powers. But I still prefer this because it generates an image oh, that gives too. so <laughs> much more... Uh, flexibility. And I've done a fairly rubbish job of uh, processing this one. Let's find the original one, if I can find the one I was playing with earlier. There's a better example, perhaps. But uh, this tool lets me generate completely gen realistic looking images with enormous flexibility to use Lightroom's tools. And I, I love this workflow. So, Ron, right. if you've got any, any sway at HDR soft, please don't have them take this tool away. It's great. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's going to permanently go away. We've had enough messages saying Good. please don't do that. But yeah, HDR soft is nice. You don't want to sell things to people. <laughs> they don't need well, I think this used to be a free uh, addition. You would buy the HDR soft pro license and get this for nothing. And then eventually it was a, an extra, was it 20, 30 bucks or something, I think? It's, uh, it's with the bundle. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The pricing models changed over the last years. But. Well, why don't you guys get another image queued up? I'm going to tackle a couple of questions here that I okay. think are good. So um, uh, Jorgen asked, should we use the camera's bracketing function or change the settings manually? I think the answer is it really depends on your camera. Uh, you know, my, my Sony A7 series can support a wide range of brackets. I've got other cameras that can only do three shots, uh, but also I could use a tool like t uh, Trigger Trap and use my smartphone to invoke a lot of bracketing. So I think it really comes down to what your camera can support. Ron, you're a big fan of doing uh, two um, brackets two steps apart. You seem to feel that with a raw file, there's plenty of info there. Is that still advice you give? Yeah, well, like, that's the limitation. That This comes from the engineers. That if, you bracket, if you bracket two two EV spacing, so two stops apart, there is enough information to create a nice 32-bit image that doesn't miss anything. Don't go, don't go path two. But if you want to use, you want to do like one EV spacing or something, that's very much up to you. 
what I, what you want to do and how you feel like the results come out. I feel I don't know this, but I feel like when I sh when I bracket with one EV spacing for interior stuff, it feels better. <laughs> I, like, I think I get better results. But again, this is nothing technical. This is just from an experience standpoint. So it's the the standard answer, which I always say is depends, and it's up to you. Um, but don't go up, don't go above two, okay? And then and actually, and that was Jurgen that asked that, right? Yeah. Um, watch last week, last watch last month's hangout that we did with Scott uh, White and Kiewicz, because he schooled me, and um, I'm a big fan of measuring the metering in my camera for the highlights and metering for the shadows, and then setting my camera to do the capture. But that gets a little difficult in the field to do the do it in your head and everything. And he said he just sets it down and he, he meters for the, the, the brightest, the, the, the darkest exposure, so he meters for the highlights. And then he just keeps adjusting whatever he said, one or two stops, taking the shot, same thing, one or two stops, check take the shot, up until he's captured the other end of the, of the dynamic range. And that's, that's, his, that's his workflow. And uh, I'm like, that makes perfect sense to me. That's if you're using a tripod, uh, probably a remote, and uh, the other thing I should mention is just make sure that your spacing is the same every time. Do one or two or one and a half, but just do it consistently through, and then you'll be all right. Okay. So I've got a golden rule I teach my students, which I think works 100% of the time in any lighting situation for bracketing. The rules are, there's two rules, and if you apply them both, you're guaranteed to be okay. Number one, your darkest image should have low, no blinking highlights in it, right? So you've captured all the highlight detail if you do that. And the second one is, your brightest image should have no data in the left-hand quarter of your histogram. If you do that, you've got all the decent shadow detail shoved into the middle of the histogram. And that's my rule. Very cool. Um, regardless of whether you're having to take three brackets or 12 brackets, that's going to work. So I'm going to show you guys a, a single image technique, which is something that most people don't usually do. And Ron and Dave, why don't you queue up another example? Also, folks, for those of you watching, please feel free to post a question in the Q&A. That's how we uh, will randomly draw from the questions up there and pick a winner to receive a copy of Photomatics later at the end of the at the Hangout. Uh, but one thing that people don't often do is pull a single image and process it. And this workflow, let me just hide the screen here, is actually valid and can be quite useful. So I have an image here that's a single raw file. And what I'm going to do is open that inside of Photomatics. And what a lot of people don't realize is that you can actually enable exposure fusion off of the single raw file. And it basically goes through and creates a bunch of different developed things from the raw file and then allows you to merge those. And it recommends using the natural preset if you do that. So if you take the raw file and you develop it, it'll hand that off. And I told it to reduce noise. That's fine. And that's not a bad idea if you're splitting it. And then we can go into Exposure Fusion and just go with natural. And you'll see that it actually pulled quite a bit of details out. And it's interesting. We can go in and sort of get the ability here to refine the brightness play with the strength, which sort of increases the distance between the shadows and the highlights there. And I really like how that's looking. Put a little bit of saturation in there. And if you look at the before and after, it's pretty nice what it pulled out. But you still, and a lot of people don't even know this, have the ability to go in and play with tone mapping presets off of that single image. And again, you can get some pretty interesting results. So if we put that side by side there, and you sort of look at the two, you can see that we got a lot more detail out of that single raw file using Photomatics. I just love the richness and the blacks and the and the clean details, especially some of the sun hitting the scales on the side here that was getting lost. You see how these just look sort of flat and dull, and now with the improved contrast and the dynamic range, the I really like how the side is popping through and the details in the eye and the the bridge here of this. Uh, Oh, I'm guessing this is a gecko, but I'm forgetting the exact... Iguana. iguana. Giant male iguana. <laughs> so um, just something a lot of people don't think about is toning that single image and exposing fusion that way, that you can actually get some pretty cool things off of that single image with the ability to really get nice contrast and everything else. You could bump that up off of the single image and really get some nice shadows and highlights from the single raw file. So, Ron, what's the logic behind that workflow? Because I don't think too many people know about it. 
No, it's um, it's just uh, being able to benefit from that exposure fusion that, that we keep raving about, <laughs> uh, and applying it to a single raw, because exposure fusion works differently than cone mapping. It's really using the original files and just choosing the best uh, the best exposed pixel for every pixel out of your three or five or seven or however many you put in there. So normally when you open a single image, then exposure fusion is not an option. You'll notice that it's even grayed out when you open a single image. So the engineers decided to um, make a way of taking advantage of that. So I think what it does is when you en enable, I'm using your quotes if you're not seeing me, when you enable uh, exposure fusion, it's really creating three images out of a single RAW, much like if you had uh, gone into a RAW processor and changed the exposure and saved it and changed the exposure again and created these so-called fake brackets. That's a kind of an old technique to take advantage of exposure fusion was to save your GIFs or JPEGs from one RAW and then use exposure fusion. So enabling it this way is much the same. Okay. And we had a question that's sort of related to this is what works better, batching RAW files or batching JPEGs? And I would say I avoid JPEGs in general because they're evil and should only be used to distribute your files, not work on them. But Definitely. you could batch process TIFFs if you want to take advantage of tools in Photoshop or Lightroom. Uh, that when you use that plugin, that's what's happening under the hood. It's handing off TIFFs. Ron, you want to just address that one because I think that's something that people struggle with a lot. And then we'll jump over to Dave. I see he's got a pretty image queued up. Well, using using JPEGs is one of those things where it's your choice in your workflow and the space you have. And just could make it, you know, for instance, if I do a job that I'm that kind of a like a real estate thing, and it's something I do all the time, and I know I'm going to do a good job in the capture and not make mistakes, then JPEGs are probably okay. But it's really up to up to you because you lose a lot through that compression of JPEG. So let's say raw versus you know not raw. <laughs> uh, so when you open raw files in an application like Photomatix or some other applications that support raw, it's it has to convert the raw. You don't process raw. You have to convert it and then process. So what you're talking about is the difference between the quality of the raw processor and dedicated raw processors like Adobe Camera Raw, which is what Lightroom and Photoshop uses, or DxO, or there's some others that I'm escaping me now. They're going to do more. They're going to have more features and functionality. So I like to convert my raw to TIFF first and take advantage of lens correction and chromatic aberration reduction and noise reduction and all those things that are best done in RAW. So if you don't need those things, then it's up, Then you don't need those things. So um, Makes sense. My, my final answer is, as always, I know it's annoying, but it depends on <laughs> And uh, I have a whole thing about RAW that you'll be seeing from me on Photo Focus here shortly uh, that you know, kind of begs the question, it isn't should I shoot raw or should I use raw, it's when should I convert it? Should I convert it in camera? Should I convert it myself? And that depends on wh how you're using it. If you're not very um, versed in it, if it's kind of a little bit mysterious, go ahead and convert it first and combine JPEGs or TIFFs. That's my kind of final answer. <laughs> Okay. Dave, I know that you have just a few minutes left. We're seeing your screen now. Beautiful image. And while you're doing that, someone asked if you could also just yeah. summarize your um, two-part exposure rule the, again. The, okay. Two golden rules were, number one, your brightest image should have no detail in the bottom 25% of your histogram, the left-hand side of your histogram. So in other words, you should have no shadows in your brightest image. All the, all the pixels should be moved into the center or the top two-thirds of your, or three-quarters of your histogram. So that's the bright image. The darkest image should have no highlight blinkies. So you, should have, you should have no highlights blown out in your darkest image. Um, typically, what I'll do is I'll, I'll look at the scene, and I'll set my camera to automatic, say, take five or seven exposures in the bracket. Then once they've sh I've shot those five, I'll examine the histograms, and apply those two rules, and manually adjust the exposure to shoot anything required on either end. And after you've done that, you can guarantee you have everything you need to capture the whole scene. Um, in some cases, you may not use them all. Uh, you may not, uh, if, if, if the highlights are tiny, for example, that you can you can keep reshooting darker and darker pictures, trying to get the highlights to go away in a light bulb filament. You'll never get there. So you can give up at some point slightly earlier than that. But generally speaking, apply those two rules. Your brackets will be great. Okay, so 
the image that's on the screen now, though, um, someone else was asking about panoramas, and I realized this is really Ron's job, and he's the panorama guy, but I thoroughly enjoy doing panoramas in HDR as well. So I thought I'd talk a bit about this one, which I would consider to be a realistic image. Um, HDR is phenomenal for shooting um, blue hour skyline shots. And this was taken a couple of years ago in Taipei, in Taiwan. Uh, this is uh, an image comprising, I think, about 27, 27 images. Um, it's very detailed. I could blow this up probably 15 feet wide and it still look great. Um, the way I do panoramas, someone was asking whether to merge individual frames first or generate large images with each exposure and then merge them into the panorama. Um, personally, I always merge each individual pane. So if I show you the, the uh, images that were used in this, there we are. So there's one frame. That's an HDR image taken vertically of one part of the scene. It comprised, I think, five shots. One, two, three, four. Yeah, five, five individual exposures, which I then pull into Photomatics and Tone Map. And when I Tone Map the very first one, I never touch the settings again. The Photomatics, when you close down the tool and reopen it, the settings that appear are exactly the ones that you used in the previous image. So if I want to ensure that I've got the same settings in all five or all seven of the panorama frames, I just make sure I open them one after the other and just hit save and save image on each one. Um, I think that may be a setting you can turn off. Ron, is that the case? If I, the, the remembering the previous settings is a, a, a so it's enable. A pre it's a preference you can have either yeah. previous or default. The default. Okay, I always set previous for panorama work. And Dave, I do it the same way that you do, but I believe Ron is of the opposite school of thought. He merges yeah, all of his I, shots. I, I'll show okay. the opposite as soon as you're done, okay? <laughs> right. So the reason I do it this way is because I didn't have PT GUI to begin with. And if I was using PT GUI, apparently it's better you'd merge a single image with the center exposure, save the recipe, and then apply that to all of them. That, I, I gather that's a good way of So old fashioned, you and your accent. You know. <laughs> oh, sorry. Anyway, this, this has worked beautifully for me for the last, what, 10 years or something. So I end up with my, let's have a look, where's the rest of the TIFFs in here? There's another one of the individual exposures. Whoops. And moving on again, there's another one here. Since so I, know, I end up with... I know, I know several other people in addition to me are wondering what's the focal length you used. This was about 70 millimeters, I think. Let's have a look. 40 millimeters, actually, in this case. I was shooting it with a 24, no, 20 to 300, my travel lens. So 40 millimeters um, center exposure was, let me have a look, four seconds at f6.7 in this case, all in a tripod. But once, once I have my five or seven, however many it is, TIFF files from each individual frame, I then pull them together. And in this case, I used Photoshop uh, to, to merge the the panorama. Nowadays, I could do it in Lightroom, of course, because that function is now pulled into Lightroom. Or I could use PT GUI if I wanted to do that as well. So anyway, Ron, tell me why I'm wrong. Go and tell me how you do your panoramas now. Well, there is no wrong. Okay? But, yeah. uh, <laughs> He's just going to say there's personal preference. I, I, no, I've seen I'm Ron's you, panoramas, Dave. and they're fantastic, <laughs> so I'm, I'm keen to learn from him. Well, what, the thing is, um, and you know this location, Dave. Um, so the thing is, uh, if you do your the, the, the way you did it, um, be sure to use Exposure Fusion because tone mapping will come out with different results based on the unique makeup of the image. So, for example, if you have a blue sky then and then there's some clouds in one and, say, the sun in another one, they're going to come out quite different. They're not going to blend very well. So Exposure Fusion does that less, still a little bit, but you'll need to use Exposure Fusion. So what I did here, and the person, uh, I'm screen sharing so I can't see his name, I think it was Tim was asking about the panoramas, and this is a full 360 of a hotel room. So what you're looking at here is six already stitched panoramas, one of them for each exposure, uh, one for each shutter speed. But uh, I can even kind of uh, shuffle through them. So this is, the brightest one is just, the only thing you can see in this is the, the darkest areas of that kind of kitchen area and underneath things. And I can scroll through, it gets darker all the way until I can see the nice Hawaiian view outside there. So this was done in PT GUI, yes, so it's a bit specialized, I realize. But if somebody's really into panoramas, um, ptgui.com, it's kind of the, I would say it's the standard now. And there's a pro version and a 
whatever they call the regular version. And so I like to first use this kind of method where I put all of my bracketed shots, all my overlapping shots in PT GUI, and that will actually render me these, they call them blend planes, so I have one, again, for each exposure. And it's kind of like a cooking show, so I already loaded them in photomatics to save time. So this is what you see when you get in there, and it looks a little strange because it's this is a you know a spherical image, but it's been flattened out, so it has those kind of weird angles. Um, you get used to looking at it when you do panoramas for a while. And talk about having a small area of a window compared to the rest of the image. This is a really extreme example, I would say. So let me zoom into the window area just so you can see what's going on there a little better. And this is Fusion Natural, and with one click, let me fit this in here. With one click, I'll go to the interior shot. Oops, I lost my zoom level. There we go. So already, just with with a single, just with a, one of the presets, I can already see the interior and the exterior all at the same time, and in I would say a quite a realistic result. I don't know. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. um, and I can go interior two, which is a little bit stronger version, so it brings the brightness up um, a little bit. That's what I usually like to do. So there you go. Now you can tone map an entire panorama that's that's already stitched. And then if I go back to fit, I just once I take away the histogram. Once I click apply uh, and I check the 360 degree box so that it matches up the, the sides, uh, this is going to be interactive. So as you rotate around there won't be a line there because the settings are different on each side. It's going to line those. So once I click apply, then that'll take a minute to apply it, and then I have a single image to work with. So I was going to beg to differ with you and always having to use Exposure Fusion there their own. Um, oh, yeah. I did a shoot recently um, for a client who does a Christmas market every year, and uh, it was just begging for tone mapping and a totally unrealistic result. And mm -hmm. in that case, I used tone mapping on a cylindrical panorama and it looks good to me but then again there's enough busyness in here you probably can't see any discontinuities anyway. Um, yeah, I was going to say that I'm using exposure uh, tone mapping with contrast optimizer here and it's mo the, the color needs a little bit of work but I think it's a realistic as far as the levels of the exposure already just a you know quote unquote out of the box. Um, so it, I, was, I meant to mention earlier that uh, we you do not have to use Exposure Fusion for realistic interiors by any means. There's a contrast optimizer now, which, uh, again, this is not finished, but it's most of the way there already. And it does preserve the highlights and shadows really well. And then there's, you know, we're not even talking about Details Enhancer, but Details Enhancer is where it all started, and it's still the most powerful from what I've used as far as maintaining the highlights and shadows. And if you don't use it heavy-handedly, and then you do a little bit of post-processing, like a little bit of additional contrast um, mm -hmm. in, in Lightroom, that's the, the black slider, just bring that down a little bit, just to bring some of that, some back, excuse me, <laughs> just to bring back a little bit of those, the black areas that we need to make a, a really attractive photograph. So with a little bit of post-processing, there's nothing wrong with going with Details Enhancer if you're um, comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. I can stop screen sharing and see what's questions will come up. <laughs> there we go. I believe we're about to lose you. Sorry? Rich, I think you're muted, Rich. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I just had to toggle the mute button three times. Yeah. Around. Thank you, Google. Dave, I believe we were about to lose you at three o'clock. I'm going to have to drop off in can a couple you, of minutes. Yeah. Can you tell people where to find out more about your stuff and where they can learn from you? The best place to start is just my website at davewilsonphotography.com, and you can find links there to Twitter and Google Plus and Facebook and all the usual places, Instagram. And there's also various tutorials there, and you could even look for me on Photo Focus because there's a couple of my articles on your site too. Yeah, we appreciate that. And uh, uh, Ron, we'll get your things in just a second. I think I know what our next hangout's going to be, Ron, because people keep asking about it. I think we're going to have to do a pano hangout where we do some 360s and some regulars and some Lightroom workflow and some HDR, HDR soft workflow and 
put them head to head and show why we use them all together for all that goodness. And you could show people PT GUI in real life because I still don't know how to use it after all these years of shooting. <laughs> Ron, where can people watch, find you? Uh, watch the Linda dot the Linda title that we're working on, and you'll see how to use it. <laughs> oh, I have to watch your parts of the video. Got it. <laughs> so, uh, it's taken me a long time to figure out exactly how to to make it. Concise, but yeah. <laughs> we had one unanswered question, Ron, if you could take it here at the end, which was any recommendations for shooting into the sun at sunset or head on for an HDR? And the only thing that I would say is be very careful uh, about doing that so you don't burn your sensor. So it'd be, you know, maybe yeah. manually bracket or don't sit there on an eight second exposure directly pointed in the sun. Right. Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. Is Yeah, keep the shutter speeds fast. Um, I've heard that happens, but I've, I've shot directly into the sun and I haven't burned out any sensors yet. And, uh, I have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Shooting video. Maybe Sorry. I don't feel like I should give advice on it because uh, you know, I have some that are kind of neat that, that just the same rules apply. Just make sure you cover the dynamic range. And when you have the sun in the view, the dynamic range is that much bigger. So just make sure that you um, you know, have the, you can get the sun captured with like the, the fastest shutter speed might be 4,000th of a second on some cameras, more often 8,000th, I guess. Just make sure that you can capture the sun with that. And once, like Dave said, once you have it, you have the dynamic range fully covered, you'll be good. <laughs> you'll have all the options in the world once you're processing. Yeah, one of the problems that I've had with the well, aside from the fact it's very difficult to get it looking right in processing, is that the sun actually moves quite quickly towards sunset. Yeah. So you have to be very careful to shoot your brackets quickly. You have a smear yeah. rather than a circle. I'm trying to find the on the fly an example. I have one that's directly into the sun, but now I can't find the result on my Lightroom here. So. That's okay. We can, we'll come back to that one. It was just a good tip. We'll, we'll save that for the next Hangout. There was one last question about that 32-bit plug-in that Dave showed, and uh, I can show you the answer to that on the website. So if you are at uh, Photomatics website, you'll see that they have Photomatics Pro, which is the standalone version, plus the Lightroom plug-in. So that gives you the 32-bit plug-in, correct? Or is that just the export plug-in? You're, uh, yeah, the, I'm sorry, I missed what you said there. The you to get the 32-bit plug-in. I see it down here under the Plus bundle. That's where you get the Merge to 32-bit plug-in, correct? Yeah, Pro, Pro Plus includes everything that you see there. And uh, downloading um, down at the bottom, you should see the 32-bit. Uh, there you go. And then click on Why Has It Been Removed, and you'll see all the uh, download and purchase. Okay. So if you're already an existing customer, uh, if you want that, I'm imagining if they contact customer support, they could pay you the $20 and upgrade to the Plus bundle? Yeah, you can do that. And uh, for the few people out there still using Aperture, you guys still support it, which is great. So uh, you can find that. Download the free trials, guys. That's a good thing. Oh, it looks like you have a Black Friday sale available until next yeah, Sunday. Right. Perfect. Yeah, well, so yeah. perfect timing. Well, let's give away a copy. Let me and stop then, the screen. By, by the way, by the way uh, there are some discounts out there that you can get on, on Photomatics things, but HDRsoft itself <laughs> gives one discount a year and that's it. <laughs> that's pretty that's a pretty good one, twenty five percent. Cool, cool. Well thank you guys and uh, thank you all for the positive feedback. We really appreciate that. We're gonna take a look at the questions that were answered and randomly select here. So let's see here. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pages. So calling up the random number generator website. We have random.org. There we go. And there are seven pages. That exist, random.org. Random.org is a random number generator. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's awesome. So let me start the screen no, share. Never, never wrote. So you guys can see the random number generator, right? So we generate it, and it's page six. So one, two, three, four, seven five, questions. six. And we've got one, two, three, four, five, six names on that page. So here's the screen, and uh, that was the first one, page six. So now we got six ch names to choose from. Generate number one, JP uh, Lowensig. So JP, you have won. Ron, can you tell him how to collect his prize? Yes, email me. <laughs> well, email us, uh, support at hdrsoft.com. Easy to remember, right? And just say, uh, you know, hang out winner, and I'll see it. Um, might be if I get on there today, I'll do it today. Uh, uh, tomorrow, it'll be the latest. I'll send you. Um, I'll take care of it. 
<laughs> Excellent. Well, Dave, thank you so much for joining us. Ron as well. And uh, I always, to be perfectly honest, I love when I learn something in a Hangout, and I learn something from each of you today. So I really appreciate that. And uh, thank you all for tuning in live. Great questions from the audience today. It makes our job so much easier. So really appreciate that. If you missed part of this Hangout, uh, it should be available within about 5 to 15 minutes after this ends. You could revisit that same Google Plus page, and it will be available as a YouTube replay. And we'll do a follow-up post on PhotoFocus later next week. Thank you guys so much.